You know the famous joke, a journalist goes around and asks a Russian, a Pole, and an Israeli the same question. He first goes to the Russian, excuse me, what's your opinion of the meat shortage? The Russian says, what's an opinion? The reporter then goes to the Pole, excuse me, what's your opinion of the meat shortage? The Pole goes, what's meat? He then goes to the Israeli, excuse me, what's your opinion of the meat shortage? The Israeli replies, what? Excuse me. Norman Finkelstein speaks for no one but himself and, and, and a handful of people who have such hatred for America. A famous English aristocrat once said that if a person walked down the streets of London telling the truth to people he met, he'd probably be killed before he went uh, a couple hundred meters. Excuse me. Every single member of my family on both sides was exterminated. Both of my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And it's precisely and exactly because of the lessons my parents taught me and my two siblings and I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. Norman Finkelstein. He's a professor of political science. He's been at the center of numerous heated academic and political disputes. Who has ever managed to stifle you? We look at you, there's a plethora of books out there, The Rise and Fall of Palestine, The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering Beyond Chutzpah. living proof that the debate hasn't been stifled at all, aren't you? You're not tucked away in some dusty room, unable to speak, are you? Today, a debate and a new book called The Case for Israel. It's by Alan Dershowitz, who is one of the nation's foremost appellate lawyers, Felix Frankfurter, professor of law at Harvard Law School. And why don't we start with you laying out the thesis of your latest book, The Case for Israel. Well, I wanted to write a progressive liberal case for the two-state solution, which I think that most Israelis favor and have favored for a long time. I argue in the book that no country in history faced with comparable threats, both external and internal, has ever tried so hard to comply with the rule of law. I compare Israel favorably to the United States It's in this regard. Uh, Norman Finkelstein, your response. I was asked to come in and discuss his new book. I went home, purchased one copy. In fact, I purchased two copies. I read the book very carefully. I did what, what someone serious does with a book. I read the text, I went through the footnotes, I went through it very carefully. And there's only one conclusion one can reach, having read the book. And this is a scholarly judgment, it's not an ad hominem attack. Mr. Dershowitz has concocted a fraud. I grew up in Borough Park. Right now, as you're filming, we're in Ocean Parkway near Coney Island. A 
it was a, a simple neighborhood. I wouldn't call it poor. We were not poor then, we were simple. My father was a factory worker. Uh, my mother stayed home with the kids. I don't have acute memories of Borough Park. We were there till I was eight, 1961. We moved to an upwardly mobile, lower middle class neighborhood. It's called Mill Basin. It's also very near here. Uh, it was all Jewish, second generation Jews who were middle level professionals, accountants, uh, store owners, a smattering of doctors, a few lawyers. Very ambitious and very aggressive. This was an elbow, an elbow neighborhood. Everybody was out to make it. 47 years ago, Poland and Germany were witness to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and this week I had the great privilege of meeting and interviewing one of the ghetto's few survivors, Mrs. Mary Finkelstein. I remember that my biggest desire and dream was that if I ever survive, I will stay tall and tell people the story. I now am strictly a pacifist, and I believe that if you kill, you don't kill. With the first killing, you already lost. My parents were survivors of Nazi concentration camps. Sometimes I was afraid to ask because I was, I thought it was going to be like opening up the sluice gates. Everything is going to come out and I wouldn't be able to handle it. I just did not want to know. My first involvement publicly and politically with the Israel-Palestine conflict was the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in June 1982. Uh, the estimates are, you know, somewhere around 20,000 Palestinian and Lebanese, overwhelmingly civilians, were killed. Immediately as the war began, I started to demonstrate outside the Israeli consulate, right off 42nd Street. I was out there every day, every night, and I had a big poster which read, this son of survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, Auschwitz and Majdanek, will not be silent. Israeli Nazis stopped the Holocaust in Lebanon. I did manage to get all of that on one poster. <laughs> And so I started to read voraciously on the Israel-Palestine conflict. So now I had both a political commitment and a scholarly commitment. And then obviously I'm Jewish, so I had a personal commitment. And the three came together and as I went back and forth to the occupied territories during the first intifada, I went to live with a couple of Palestinian families and uh, developed enduring relationships in particular with the fellow up there. He came in 1988 you know, at the start of the first intifada. And Norman, you know, the very good thing about Norman, he did not hide the fact that he was a Jew. Even it was very dangerous at that time to, you know, tell people that you are Jewish. And he came, and from the very first minute, we liked Norman, he liked us. And uh, uh, we became friends. I would go back every summer and live with the same families and sort of 
experience the intifada from the ground up. And it was a kind of, it was a tacit quid pro quo. They kept me, but with the expectation that I would write something. There was no uh, guidance, instruction about what to write, but I would write something about what's happening there. And so each summer when I came back, I was basically chronicling it from year to year. And then I eventually put it together as a book. It was summer, 1989, and we, we talked together, Norman and I, and Norman asked several questions. He asked me if I like Jews, and I said no. At that moment, Norman uh, revealed the fact that he was a Jew himself. I was shocked and afraid at the same time. I didn't expect that he is a Jew, this is one thing, and I am talking to someone that I have just revealed that I hate. Norman was always a very political person. Even in 10th grade, 11th grade, he was always very political. He was probably more political than anybody that I knew at the time, and we were, many of us, very political. Being, being against the war in Vietnam was very, uh, was, was in vogue. That was the thing to do. But Norman was truly, was truly against it. You know, I couldn't understand why you weren't torn apart by what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam. You had these scenes on television of little girls whose flesh was being incinerated. His mother had an extraordinary influence on him. She took the lessons of the Holocaust in a different direction than what many other people do, and that the Jews have a special obligation to... Um, to try to ease the suffering of humanity because of what was done to them. And she couldn't bear to see what America was doing in Vietnam, for example. And I think he, Norman was, was just completely influenced by his mother to an unhealthy extent. From early on, in every facet, my life as a Jewish person, my life as an uh, American, every facet, was out of step. I grew up in this very peculiar household in which values were deeply instilled. I mean, other people gave lip service to the values, you know, the equality of humankind, war is wrong, and so forth. But in my home, it was not lip service. It, it bordered on hysteria. I mean, my mother reacted to war, not like, oh, it's wrong, a Sunday morning sermon. No. She reacted in almost a hysterical rage. I, I know we would get together some evenings, and uh, particularly during heavy political times, like during the Vietnam War, or right after the Kennedy assassination. And there, everyone would kind of gather around the television. And my mother would normally be yelling at the television. She would get very, very irate over things that were being said. Uh, she and my younger brother, Norman, were very similar. <laughs> they were both very political. Extremely so, very strong views. <laughs> 
the most important thing that that made Norman to be this exact person is that uh, his mother telling him that her, it was so painful, so awful, that while they were going through this difficult situation being uh, face to face with death every moment in their life nobody in the whole world cared from my parents I got the moral commitment but what I got from Professor Chomsky was a way to articulate it intellectually without losing the passion and commitment. It was a way to do both. Uh, that's what I got from him. You read him and there's a moral force behind his words. However, sometimes he could seem to be saying it very dryly, though not always. You know, the language of hoodlums and hooligans uh, and murderers and thugs. I think I appropriated some of it from him. He, he entered my life at an important point. I had a very tough time at Princeton, and I had real doubts about my ability, capacity, and he restored it. He said, you have something to say. Well, I met him uh, the time he was a graduate student. He was a graduate student at uh, Princeton. Uh, in uh, in the Middle East Department, working on the history of Zionism. And at that time, a book appeared, a Joan Peters' book from Time Immemorial, uh, which was receiving uh, enormous uh, praise everywhere, hundreds of laudatory reviews and greatest things, mints, chocolate ice cream. Shalom. Hello again. We've been very fortunate lately in attracting some major spokesmen on the Middle East, and uh, we have one of those tonight. Joan Peters wrote the book, From Time Immemorial. This is a textbook used in uh, the United States and in Israel. Uh, it's a voluminous copy on the origins of the Arab-Jewish conflict. We sat her down and asked her her reason for writing From Time Immemorial. Who are the Palestinians that they should commend so much importance that the life and death of the world's peace might depend on it? It is a scam, and it must be exposed. The book was completely preposterous and worthless. The book said that there were no Palestinians in Palestine until the Zionists came along and made the desert bloom, and then the Palestinians began to arrive to Palestine. It was the book that was of no value whatsoever. It simply recycled propaganda. But it was the book that American Jews wanted to have because it completely whitewashed Israel. And um, the book was a huge success and received every accolade uh, in America until Norman Finkelstein wrote a long review article in which he exposed the spurious scholarship behind um, that book. And I sent out my findings to like 25 people, typed them up. And then one Saturday morning I got a call from Professor Chomsky. He said, this is Noam Chomsky, and he said, I read your findings, and they, they sound right to me. I answered him. He told me later I was the only person who answered him. And uh, I he, his question was, look, does it look as if this is a good topic, a serious topic to study? And he said, I said, you know, I read it. It's very solid. It's a very good topic to study. But if you go into it, do it with eyes open. Uh, you are not only going to undermine this book and show that it's a fraud, but you're going to undermine the whole U.S. intellectual community. Everything is going to be controversial today. Generally, it isn't. Uh, but there are certain issues and certain subjects where debate can be difficult.
This book is The Holocaust Industry, and Norman Finkelstein is the author. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you for having me. Controversial, I, I can't not use the word. It's been overused and it's hackneyed. Uh, but... Norman Finkelstein, weitergeben, Norm, the floor is yours. I remain faithful to the horrendous suffering of my late parents, yet the Nazi Holocaust has long ceased to be a source of moral or historical enlightenment. It has become a straight out extortion racket. A handful of American Jews have effectively hijacked the Nazi Holocaust to blackmail Europe. I read uh, Finkelstein's book, The Holocaust Industry, when it came out. I was actually at that point in the middle of looking at the same data, and I convinced myself that with respect to part two of the book, which is to say the claims against the Swiss banks, Finkelstein was certainly on the right track. And I would now say, after I have looked into the matter even more, that forgetting the style in which he was writing, his conclusions were moderate. Norman is a very uh, careful scholar, and he feels very passionately about the Holocaust. His parents are both survivors of extermination camps, and he was deeply, uh, you know, he, he was deeply involved in their lives and their tragedies and so on, and knows everything about the Holocaust. But, uh, and we see somebody uh, using it, uh, exploiting it, you know, demeaning the memory of the victims for personal gain. He didn't like it. I can understand that. These Holocaust hucksters have become the main fomenters of anti-Semitism in Europe, as well as the main purveyors of Holocaust denial. I do slightly disagree with the tone of his voice when he discusses these matters because I do feel that uh, remembrance, especially organized remembrance, is costly. It doesn't just happen. It isn't just done by volunteers. And there is no avoiding something like an organization that can be called an industry. This is not about some construction of memory. This is about people using history for their political purposes. There is no new anti-Semitism. This is pure fabrication. There is a creation of a new anti-Semitism to serve the same purpose as was used for the past 20 years, the Holocaust industry to divert attention from what's being done to the Palestinians. So everybody is talking about the new anti-Semitism instead of what's being done to the Palestinians. And in a wonderful inversion to turn Israel and its supporters into the victims and turn the Palestinians and their supporters into the victimizers, turning reality totally on its head. The very first story Norman told us was when he arrived in Ramallah in Al-Ma'ari camp. And 
not very far from him. He was close to the incident when, you know, a boy was shot. He was, you know, burning a tire. And they shot and killed the boy. And no man collapsed. He was crying all the time. For me, it's a surprise that, you know, a man uh, crying. So he cried, you know, many times. When he mentioned the story, he used to cry. From that, I knew how, you know, deeply uh, Norman was, you know, touched in, by the situation. And, uh, he's very human. You know, you cannot, you know, the, uh, the main thing is how uh, deep is uh, he is human. My late mother did not like what I had become. She was afraid. And she was very guilty. She felt I was Frankenstein's monster, in this case, Finkelstein's monster. I had taken her too literally, taken it too much to heart, and uh, she felt I was destroying myself. Like that. <laughs> Over here. Shadi, you remember Shadi Maru? Uh -huh. He made it. Uh, do you hate it? <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay, fine. It's I don't fine. understand what's the news for, though. It's about, it's like, kind of like strangling the Palestinians. Oh. Nobody gets it. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little too artsy. I, I, I know, I, I get it. That is what's made him famous. He wrote a book called The Holocaust Industry. The whole point of the book right, is to there. trivialize I am not blocking. The I whole point the of the book was to trivialize and minimalize Jewish suffering that took place in the Holocaust. That has nothing to do with the conflict that's going on in the Middle East. The only thing that it does is it adds to the tension on campus. He made his entire career is based on trivializing the Holocaust. Let Norma speak! Let Norma speak! Let Norma speak! This is a strange school. <laughs> you know how often I speak, I never get demonstrations. I think the school is off the map. <laughs> I want to calm, I I yeah, I calm right. the things down. We want a successful evening. Right. They want to make us jittery, yeah. disorient us, ruin the evening. So we have to not play into their hands. That's true. Calm. Mm -hmm. If they shout, let security take care of it. Okay. But don't let them ruin the evening. Okay. okay. With all due respect, uh, I'm an old timer. I know how deeply frustrating it can be when you're sitting in the audience and somebody goes on for an hour and a half saying things that you find utterly, utterly loathsome, repulsive, and also you think factually incorrect. And uh, I, think, I think people should have more than 60 seconds. As I said, I'll leave it to the patience of the audience. When you feel it's going on too long, you know how to express your disapproval, otherwise they should be allowed to go on. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah. During your speech, you made a lot of references to Jewish people, as well as certain people in your audience, not Jewish people in general, but certain people, especially in your audience, to Nazis. Now, that is extremely offensive when certain people are German. And they're also extremely offensive to people who've actually suffered under Nazi rule. I don't respect that anymore. I really don't. I don't like and I don't respect the crocodile tears to, con to the crocodile tears. No. Uh, I'm 
So, folks, um, allow me to finish, and allow me to hear, allow me to finish. Listen, sir. Allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Uh, sir, sir, I don't like to play. I don't like to play before an audience the Holocaust card. But since now I feel now I feel compelled to. My late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother, please shut up. My late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother was in Maidana concentration camp. Every single member of my family on my father's side, on my father's side, the Jews did not take arms against the my Germans. My late father was in Auschwitz concentration camp. My late mother was in Maidana concentration camp. Every single member of my family on both sides was exterminated. Both of my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And it's it precisely and exactly because of the lessons my parents taught me and my two siblings that I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. And I consider nothing more despicable than to use their suffering and their martyrdom to try to justify the torture, the brutalization, the dem demolition of homes that Israel daily commits against the Palestinians. So I refuse any longer to be intimidated or browbeaten by the tears. If you had any heart in you, you would be crying for the Palestinians. Not for what she does. What? Can I just come the audience? <clears throat> I've never been in a crowd like this. They're nuts. I think it's pretty audacious when people try to play the Holocaust card with me. I think that's pretty nervy. What percent of the audience was opposed to me? About a quarter or a fifth? A quarter. And the girl in the dark t-shirt who was yelling about the anti-Semitism throughout the thing, she began to yell, uh, well, they're probably turning over in their graves right now. Sorry, my parents were alive throughout most of my struggle, and they totally supported me. That one won't work. It's not like I did about face in 1995 when my parents passed away. I've been doing this since 1982. They heard every word. I never heard an objection. Believe me, sometimes I wonder whether it's worth it. As I like to say, speaking as a devout atheist, thank God that in his almighty wisdom he made us mortal. We don't have to endure it through eternity. Norman Finkelstein is a classic anti-Semite. He invokes the oldest stereotypes against the, the Jews. If he were not a Jew, that is, I don't think he is a Jew. He is, as, as someone once put it, he's Jewish only on his parents' side. Uh, uh, if he were not a Jewish person or a person of Jewish heritage with a name like Finkelstein, nobody would have any doubt that he was an anti-Semite. It's only because he's Jewish. Sometimes I feel that he's a self-hating Jew. He's certainly a Jew-hating Jew. Jew the same, right? I suppose that's the same thing. He, he definitely... Um, his most vehement and rabid criticisms are of Jews, it seems to be. Why does he hate? I, I don't know. I really don't know. But his criticisms of Jewish lawyers are so full of, so full of hate and so full of contempt. The way that he's singled out Israel for criticism...
There's an old Woody Allen routine where he talks about being, uh, being thrown out of, a, out of a metaphysics exam because he peeked into the soul of the guy next to him. You know. um, I, I can't peek into Norma Finkelstein's soul. I don't know what motivates him. I've met in my career a lot of Jews who have issues with aspects of their own identity. The point is to look at what he does and uh, the effect of what he does. He's created a phantom Israel, a monster Israel, uh, but there's no relationship to the real country that I live in. It's good to be critical of Israel. Many Israelis are critical of Israeli policies. Uh, many Israelis are uh, 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 anti-Zionist even. I have no problem with people challenging and critiquing Zionism, Israel, Israeli policies. Uh, I would never call the person who merely did that anti-Semitic. What Finkelstein does goes well beyond that. For me, the Jews from the left who only see evil in Israel are probably representing a problem within themselves. Um, they are struggling with their identity, they're struggling with their Judaism, they're struggling with uh, their heritage. Okay, for argument's sake, let's assume it's true. Let's say I have deep identity conflicts. Let's assume it's all true. What's the relevance? The only relevant question is, whether what I'm saying is true or false. Let's say Einstein had deep identity conflicts. How does that influence one's judgment about his physics? The Israel question, whatever you feel about the justice or injustice of the establishment of the state of Israel, whatever you think about that, that's a historical question. There is now a current political question. Are the Palestinians, are the Palestinians entitled to their self-determination? There are two people living in that land. One people have the full rights of statehood in 80% of the land. And the people who occupied that land for several thousand years consecutively are being denied their right to self-determination in 20% of their homeland. Thank you. I don't entirely agree with the previous speaker. <laughs> this isn't the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's the Israeli-Palestinian front of the Arab-Israel conflict. A Wall Street Journal journalist called Daniel Pearl goes to Pakistan uh, to do a, a story on Islamic extremists. And he gets kidnapped. Now, they kidnapped him because he was an American journalist, and therefore, obviously, like all American journalists, he must be a CIA agent. But once they kidnapped him, they discovered, double word score, he was a Jew. 
and as a matter of fact, technically speaking, an Israeli. They got so excited about it that they made him confess on the camera, speaking to a video camera, perhaps not unlike this one, forced him to confess on camera, I am a Jew, the son of a Jewess. And then they slit his throat. The people who did that have never been stopped at an Israeli checkpoint. People who did that probably never saw an Israeli. No matter what the roots of this conflict are, we've evolved into a situation today in which large segments of the world, at a time when in the Western world anti-Semitism has almost vanished in its classical sense, large sections of the world are infi infected with something that's almost indistinguishable from anti-Semitism. The entire world community, save between one and six states, depending on the vote, the entire world community believes that the Palestinians should have their right to self-determination in 20% of their homeland. Israel and the United States are denying them that right. It's as simple as that. And you can drag in anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, Daniel Pearl, and everything else, but it can't change the fundamental facts. The fundamental facts are these. The entire world community supports a two-state settlement along the June 1967 borders. Israel and the United States, the chief rejectionists in the world, are opposed to it. I have many issues with Mr. Finkelstein's position, uh, but chief among them is his notion that really this, co this situation which has persisted in the Middle East for decades really comes down to something very simple. Uh, it's all the fault of the Israelis, uh, but I think there are a number of reasons that could explain Mr. Finkelstein's popularity uh, with those individuals who support the Palestinian side of the Middle East question. First, he is, uh, without a doubt, a well-read and articulate spokesperson of their cause. Second of all, and I have to really be quite uh, candid here, the fact of the matter is, is that Norman Finkelstein uh, is a member of the Jewish community, and to have a member of the Jewish community speak out against the state of Israel gives his words a certain cachet that a non-Jew or a Palestinian spokesperson uh, would, uh, would simply would not have. Your name? Mohammed. M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D. Okay. Uh, a fellow writes, Two hours have now passed since leaving the debate at the U of Toronto, and my blood pressure and pulse rate are finally back within normal limits. I have one question for you. Do you, an educated, articulate scholar, really believe even one-tenth of one percent of the nonsense you vomit out on your audience? Or is, just a, or is it just a cleverly calculated con to get attention? So I wrote him back saying it's worse than you think. I believe 100% of what I said last night. And we got into an extensive email correspondence, at the end of which he recommended that I join the Flat Earth Society. And that's where matters ended. <laughs> it was funny. When there are cruel things in front of me, I simply pull down the eyes and try not to see it. The war made my reason and my belief and everything turn 180 degrees. You shouldn't use this one back. No, I don't. Actually, you should put it back. Put it back. You don't know what's going to happen. Here. Nothing's going to happen. Okay. Well, you don't know that. This is this is a little different crowd. We don't have to go up in the silliness. I can walk in through the front. Nobody's going to assassinate me. Just because uh, look at the crowd here. Someone threw an egg at you or whatever. And you don't put yourself in there. So they didn't say a good word about Israel. Let's be clear about one thing. In my view, Israelis have the right to be there. They have the right to exercise self-determination uh, in uh, what's historic Palestine. I have no question in my mind about that. And I have many friends who live there, many people who I deeply respect. I have no interest 
whatsoever in playing this game of bashing Israel. That's not my thing. But, but, allow me the but for those of you who are snickering, but just as it would be shameful, shameful for any German during World War II to give a lecture singing the praises of Germany, and just as during the U.S. war in Vietnam, for me to sing the praises of the U.S., amid the horror and amid the suffering, I'm not going to sing the praises of Israel. When the war is over, when Palestinians have equal rights, when there's justice there, I'll be very happy to join along with everybody in singing Israel's accomplishments and criticizing its faults but not while and when it's torturing the Palestinians. We do have the problem that every time an effort is made on the Palestinian or on the European side to negotiate an end to the violent attacks against Israel, which I have no fear at all calling terrorist, so long as you have no fear calling the leader of the state of Israel one of the main terrorists in the world today. I would not say I was in absolutely top form. But you did great, but the media now has an opportunity to grab on a couple things. Like what? Well, the last question about Palestinian terrorism. Well, I thought I answered it. No, you did, but the yeah. point is it'll be in the media tomorrow, so the focus will be on Palestinian terrorism mm -hmm. instead of, you know, Israeli terrorism or whatever. I, th I think it's a question of priorities. I spoke for two hours, Beautiful. and people showed an enormous amount of tolerance in letting me speak for two hours and therefore I have an obligation to let people have their say. You know, I'm saying things which deeply upset many people in the audience. If they controlled themselves for two hours and showed me their respect, then I have an obligation to let them let out their feelings and thoughts. And complain about using the media to get I don't want to, you see, I don't want to use the media. I don't like expressions like that. I don't want a success which is based on ruthlessness, a success that's based on uh, 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 the victory of scoundrels. No. Did you get a copy of the Finkelstein industry? No. It said uh, Norman Finkelstein is profiting from the Holocaust, just like the industry that he criticizes, mm -hmm. and using the memory of his parents to profit off of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it said. What do you think of that, Roman? Well, it's a strange way to profit, to lose your job and be thrown into exile in a place where you uh, don't want to be after 50 years of living in New York. It's an odd sort of profiteering where I end up living in Chicago and uh, uh, losing my job. Uh, there are many anomalies. I mean, I'd have to be an awful, uh, awful, irrational profiteer uh, to go about things the way I've done it. I mean, I, I'm not complaining. I'm not saying I've, you know, suffered a martyr's life. But um, the claim that I made out better by taking the political positions I've done, taken, and had I not taken them, I think that's a lot of, a, a little bit absurd. I didn't make out so well. I'm heading towards my 50th birthday this year. I still don't have a tenure track job. I just, for the first time after a half century, I got on a tenure track job with no certainty that I'll get the tenure track job. That doesn't seem like profiteering. And it'd be hard for me to believe that I couldn't have made out better if I didn't act on my principles. Not complaining, but just looking at the factual record.
I can't say ours was a happy household. My father never said a word, never a word. My mother, she always tries to derive lessons from what she experienced. She was always analyzing what happened. She thought that, you know, in the camps, you saw the secret of human nature. So she always was processing it and reprocessing it in her mind. And she said, you know, like, even like 40 years later, she says, now I understand what happened there. Like suddenly something clicked that made sense of an experience. So there was no topic that we would discuss. Anything would come back to her experiences in the camp. You could be talking about a petunia. It goes right back to the war. Everything went right back to the war. There was another disco song, which you all know, uh, I Will Survive. And I Will Survive is about a, a woman whose boyfriend you know, dumps her or leaves her, and she says, I'm not, I'll survive this. My mother loved the song. She didn't know the lyrics. She just knew the refrain, and the refrain for her was the war. So, uh, Last night, I spent uh, several hours, several unpleasant hours, reading and rereading the paper presented by Dr. Finkelstein. And I found it disturbing in a way which is not easy for me. The paper is suffused with personal hatred. And I strongly hope that when the proceedings of this conference are printed, that such parts of this paper will not be included in them. Now may I invite uh, Dr. Finkelstein to speak. We have an expression in English. The truth is often a bitter pill to swallow. We are supposed to be seriously examining history. But you mention a few words about Jewish collaborators and people get so upset. This is, I'm sorry to say, it's a form of emotional blackmail. If I'm being invited as the Jew who's going to denounce Jews, no, I don't like that at all. If I'm being invited because they think my point of view is important and it's being uh, repressed, you know, you know, that's a good enough reason. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you and welcome to a very special session of the Doha Debates. And we're here in Britain as guests of the Oxford Union, the most famous debating chamber in the world and the inspiration for the Doha Debates. He says Hamas is not recognized by the EU and the United States because Hamas won't recognize Israel. The logical question is, can you name a single Israeli government official, political party, which has ever recognized a Palestinian state within its internationally legal borders. <laughs> Namely, I keep writing back to people, please don't put me on a pedestal, because you'll end up being disappointed. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. OK. How about international law, the World Court? Do you agree with that? They said occupied Palestinian territories, the whole of the West Bank and Gaza. Do you agree with the court? That's, no. The point, yes, I agree with that, but this was an advisory opinion, as you know very well. This was not a binding decision with the full binding force of the necessity to implement. Do you agree with their opinion? Do you agree with their opinion?
I do travel a lot to lecture. However, every minute that I'm gone, I'm in agony waiting to come home. I am a very sedentary person. I like my books, my computer, my work, and my neighborhood. very wrenching for me to have to leave New York. And I'm currently teaching in Chicago. I am not happy with what happened. I didn't ask for a lot. I was earning $18,000 a year at Hunter. Nothing. And they kicked me out in the street after nine years. In my view, there is one kind of argument which I think has a certain amount of credibility. And it's that kind of argument that I want to look at this evening. So, the argument goes something like this. Palestine has a special meaning for Jews. That from a biblical point of view, from the point of view of the history of the Jewish people, Palestine has a special resonance for the Jewish people. I'm not easy to get along with. I know that. But I like young people. I like to be in the classroom, and I, I, I like the play of ideas. I think ideas are exciting, and I like to convey that to my students. To imagine a Jewish state in Argentina, in Uganda, or elsewhere, simply from the point of view of the Jewish people, makes no sense. Imagining a Jewish state in Palestine makes sense for the Jewish people. We're talking to Professor Alan Dershowitz. He's author of a new book. It's called The Case for Israel, in debate with Norman Finkelstein among his books, The Holocaust Industry and Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict. Now, in 1984, one Joan Peters published a book called From Time Immemorial. The book was universally recognized by serious scholars to be a fraud. Without wanting to toot my own horn, I'm widely recognized as the person who exposed the fraud. I know that book inside out. I read it at least four times, and I went through all 1,854 footnotes. I started to read your book, Mr. Dershowitz. I then came to chapter one, footnotes 10, footnote 11, footnote 12, footnote 13, footnote 14, footnote 15, footnote 16. All of the quotes are from Joan Peters. They are so from Joan Peters that you have a long quote here from Mark Twain on pages 23 to 24. Mm -hmm. I turn to Joan Peters, page 159 to 60, the identical quote from Twain with, with the ellipses is the, in the, the is ellipses. The Twain quote, is the Twain quote wrong? With the ellipses, the let me finish, wrong? sir. No, 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 but the, the key with is the ellipses <laughs> in the same places. The identical quote from Twain with the ellipses in the same places. It's been widely I then, quoted, as yeah, you know. Really? Now, Mr. Mr. Dershowitz, no, no, I then, I, What's your point? Is it, then is it a correct quote? quote? Let is, me finish, no, Mr. No, no, Dershowitz. Make, I want to ask we you a then question. Have a, is it, a direct, is it an okay. accurate quote of Twain? Okay. Let's Care, be very clear. It is not plagiarism yeah. to quote Mark Twain yeah. Yeah. correctly. Yeah, except, That's not except plagiarism. Except if you cite Mark Twain and not Joan Peters. I'm a professor, sir. I know what plagiarism is. We have, there's a Yiddish expression, shmata. Shmata means it's a, a rag. Like you use a shmata to do the dusting. If Dershowitz's book were made of cloth, I wouldn't even use it as a shmata. 
<laughs> I'm serious. But you just a schmata. I should have to know Yiddish to appreciate that. <laughs> Look at such a garbage. No, no. And these people are shameless. Look, he got his yesterday. And he knows he's in trouble now. In the radio debate, he didn't challenge my positions. He accused me of plagiarism. Uh, his charge was that uh, because I uh, used quotations from Mark Twain, for example, which he says I originally found in um, a, a woman named Peter's book, I had to cite the Mark Twain quotation, not to Mark Twain himself, which is, of course, what you're supposed to do according to the Chicago Manual and all other standard manuals, but I was obliged to cite it to the Peters book. I, in fact, cited Peters uh, eight times. In fact, I didn't find the Mark Twain quote in the Peters book. I found it um, years earlier when I was on a show called The Advocates in 1970 and was doing research. I came upon the um, uh, uh, Mark Twain quote for the first time uh, 12 or so years before Peters wrote her book. So certainly I was not obliged to cite Peters for Mark Twain. Um, as soon as he accused me of plagiarism, I went to Harvard University and I said, there's been this accusation. I insist that you investigate it. Please put an investigator on it. They put Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard, with whom I had not had particularly good relations over the years. And Derek Bach came to the conclusion that there was absolutely no basis for any plagiarism. You're listening to Worldview from Chicago Public Radio, and we've been talking today with Norman Finkelstein, Assistant Professor of Political Science at DePaul. Finkelstein's always had a controversial edge, but the controversy never ends in his conflict with Harvard's Alan Dershowitz. It began on the Democracy Now! radio program several years ago when he alleged that Dershowitz's book, The Case for Israel, was plagiarized. More recently, Dershowitz has mounted a long campaign against Finkelstein's tenure bid at DePaul. The president of DePaul University has until about the middle of this month to decide on the matter. That was Dr. Finkelstein. He's a professor at DePaul University who might get his tenure on Tuesday if the university allows it. But how can people like this be teaching our children in the classroom? Professor, thanks for joining us. I've got to start off by asking where things stand on your uh, tenure uh, battle at uh, DePaul University. Have you become uh, too hot for American academia to handle? The American Association of University Professors has been watching Finkelstein's case. It would suggest the demise of the American system of higher education if administrations could simply act unilaterally to get rid of faculty members that chooses not to have around. moments ago, DePaul University and myself reached a settlement. This is DePaul University's statement. Today we have reached a resolution of our dispute with Professor Finkelstein. As a part of that resolution, he has agreed to resign effective immediately. Professor Finkelstein is a prolific scholar and an outstanding teacher. The university thanks him. Yeah, too good for DePaul. Not true. The university thanks him for his contributions and his service.
I know a great deal about the Finkelstein tenure case because uh, DePaul asked me to write a letter on Finkelstein, which I did, and then I followed the case very closely uh, from start to finish. And uh, I think this is an open and shut case. I think that Finkelstein should have gotten tenure. He's not a teacher. He's a propagandist. He's not a scholar. He simply writes screeds. Uh, the scandal was that DePaul University ever appointed him in the first place. They appointed him because hard left professors who didn't care at all about his lack of scholarship just liked his ideological uh, 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 radicalism and uh, lowered the standards uh, to appoint him. So it was a good decision for DePaul University and it was a good decision for academic standards in general. What did he expect Dershowitz was going to do? He accuses Dershowitz of being a liar and a plagiarist. What, what is he going to expect for Dershowitz to keep quiet? Didn't he know the kind of connections that Dershowitz has in the United States? So why did he do it? Why couldn't he keep his mouth shut? Any normal sane person wouldn't have done anything. He writes a whole book. What did he expect? I remember talking to him over the summer. And he didn't think he would go that far. I mean, I don't know Norman as being uh, that naive, so there has to be some element of self-destruction. My own feeling was that he should downplay the issue of plagiarism. I didn't think that. First of all, I didn't think it was an important issue. Okay, so Dershowitz is a plagiarist. Who cares? It's not, it's not significant. What's significant is the material about the historical fact. And uh, he did. I, I thought he ought to put it in a separate article, just drop it. I've learned that certain things you can change and certain things you can change, okay? You go, you, go, you go swimming in the ocean. There's certain waves you can kind of swim through. And there's certain waves that are just going to overpower you. And I think um, as you go through life, you learn which waves you can kind of challenge and maybe overcome and which ones are just too much force. What one can say about Norman's work is that although his insights are often brilliant, he expresses expresses them sometimes in language that's overly provocative. And I would argue that if you're making controversial arguments, it's in your best interest to tone down your language and, and to get as much of the hot rhetoric out as possible. And I think Norman does not do that. view, most of this talk about civility is a red herring. When you consider that our best universities eagerly recruit indubitable war criminals, whether it was Columbia that sought out Kissinger, whether it was G Georgetown which employed Kirkpatrick, or Stanford which now has Rumsfeld, when you consider that professors in our best universities advocate torture and the automatic destruction of villages after a terrorist attack, when you consider all this, it becomes clear that the question of civility, whether one treats his or her critics according to Emily Post's rules of etiquette, however real the question is, is by comparison a meaningless sideshow or just a transparent pretext for denying a person the right to teach on account of his or her unpopular political beliefs. Thank you. My last time at the pool, the seniors recognized me for my outstanding ded dedication to the graduating class. And I, I would be 
remiss if I didn't mention Paul Robeson, who was my hero when I was growing up. I discovered him in 1970. I listen to it now more, the spirituals that he sang. The other day I was just vacuuming my apartment and I listened to the spiritual that goes, crippled and some come lame, bear the burden in the heat of the day. Some come walking in Jesus' name, bear the burden in the heat of the day. And uh, it suddenly clicked to me what it meant. Some people are born crippled, and some people are born lame, and they have to bear that burden their whole lives. So, well, you know, for me, it reminded me, you know, don't get, don't start wallowing in self-pity. Some come crippled and some come lame. We all bear our burdens in the heat of the day. To the outside world, the conflict in Lebanon seemed as sudden as a summer storm. When the fighting stopped a month later, 1,200 people had been killed, most of them civilians, and the map of where power lies in the Middle East had been redrawn in ways that no one expected. Many of those involved here in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and indeed in the capitals of the West, have since admitted that mistakes and misjudgments were made. started to think that maybe I am wrong. I thought that if we would have during the Second War a country like Israel, we would be saved. Well, I started to think about Zionism. You have a challenge. The challenge is to be both principled and reasonable at the same time. If you sound unreasonable, you're going to lose the international community. I don't think that's the way to win the struggle. It is very important that we have Americans here who want to show that not all the American people are against the Palestinian rights. We know when the people knows the reality, they are on the reality side. Steve Alec! Steve Alec! Steve Alec! What's this? <laughs> no, no, 
ask could I say? I could have given a rah-rah court talk, you know, long live armed struggle and smash the Zionist entity and crap like that, but A, I don't believe in it, and B, I think it's pointless. I did what I can, which is to talk reasonably intelligently about possibilities for change in the U.S. But it's been tough, you know, there was one woman, uh, you know, it's sort of like the, uh, how, how um, a, pr a profound thing comes out from a simple person. She was lying in bed, and she's 72 years old, and I asked her, how old are you? And, she's, and she lives in a little hovel, rat infested, open sewage. I said, how old are you? She said, I'm 12 years old. She said, 12 years old? She said, you're 12. Because I left Palestine when I was 12 years old, and after that there's been no life. So I'm 12 years old. And uh, it was a good line. You remember things like that. والله هو إنه زي كان زي عملية توعية للشعب الفلسطيني لأنه نحنا صار لنا زي تخلف اتجاه الأفكار هاي إنه خلاص نحنا عنا أشياء لازم نسويها هلا مثل الحرب الصهر وكذا بس نحنا نس مثل هو عنده أشياء مثل السياسة نحنا هاي الأشياء نسيناها. إنه هيك إنه هو أعطاني فكرة جديدة عن اليهود إنه مش كل اليهود هن صهاينة مش كل هدف واحد هو القتل العرب وهالأشياء هاي هي الفكرة اللي أعطاني وجود الدكتور نار ما بيساعد كتير الفلسطينية على إنه يرجعوا لبلدهم قصدي ما زالوا يهودة إذا حكي قدام اليهوديين بصيروا يجوا مع شوي شوي بصير بيقدر يهزم اللي بقلبها هلا فلسطين After the horror and after the shame and after the anger, there still remains the hope. And I know that I can get in a lot of trouble for what I'm about to say. But I think that the Hezbollah represents the hope. Sometimes I think أحياناً أفكر it's a very good thing أنه أمر جيد جداً that Hezbollah inflicted أن حزب الله a huge defeat on Israel. ألحق هزيمة كبيرة بإسرائيل. You have to keep knocking them into the head. وعليهم أن 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 يواصلوا الضرب على رأسها. Until they reach their senses. إلى أن إلى أن يعود القادة الإسرائيلي. ضيفنا ببساطة الكاتب اليهودي الأمريكي نورمان فينكلستاين اللي اشتهر بكتابة بكتابه صناعة الهولوكوست إضافة طبعا لكتب عديدة عن موضوع الصراع الفلسطيني الإسرائيلي يعني لما بتجي على لبنان بتكون زيارة محضرة لمسؤولين معينين ومنهم من ضمنهم يعني أطراف اللي هن حزب الله There is a fundamental principle People have the right to defend their country from foreign occupiers and people have the right to defend their country from invaders who are destroying their country. And that to me is a very basic, elementary, and uncomplicated question. They're going to hit me hard on supporting you guys' lives. Well, I'm not scared. It's, it's always second thoughts. Should I have said it? Shouldn't I have said it? You know, I'm like, what I feel. Oh, I, I don't know. Like my friend Alan Merritt says, 
you've achieved a certain level of credibility and one wrong move and they're going to totally discredit you. You know, and so you have to wonder where you should say what you think, but maybe you shouldn't say it. It's because it's going to be used to discredit you. And I just don't know the answer to that. I know it's accurate. That's what I think, but then they run with it, and I start wherever I go. I start getting haunted with supporter of Hezbollah, supporter of Hezbollah. Of course, those are my convictions, but do I then provide them with ammunition to attack me and make me an easier target? And I don't know the answer. I really don't. I'm just going to go back to two days and look at what happens. Happens. Look, I mean, he's not in the same class as Hezbollah. You know, he's not, he's not in a position to lob missiles on northern Israel and make a third of the country uninhabitable. Um, he's not a clear and present danger in the way that Hamas is. But what he and people like him are, are enablers of terrorism. Uh, they're, they're people who are creating a climate, uh, incrementally, in which um, Israel's legitimacy is no longer considered axiomatic in which violence against civilians is no longer axiomatically ruled out. I can think of no greater punishment for him than him to have to stand in line to wait for an Eged bus, for him to have to uh, worry about the price of food and the local grocery. I would think the best possible solution for Norman Finkelstein is to put him down in Israel and let him see what it's like to live as a Jew. God would laugh. discontent a person feels with the world. I see it as radically unfair and therefore it has to be radically changed. Other people who think it's wrong but the inequities are not radically wrong. It's the world, you know, who you choose through whose eyes, through whose eyes you choose to see the world. This is a radically unfair place and it requires a radical change. I think that in one's life one should try to come to some sort of settlement, some sort of um, point of acceptance and peace. But everyone, I think, finds it in a different way. So sometimes you have to create a lot of controversy in order to understand better and then to reach a settlement. Some people never get to that point. I have very warm memories of my youth. Uh, I happened, I felt I, I grew up in very, you know, good times. You know, that song, Though, you won't know it, those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. We'd sing and dance forever and a day. We'd fight, we'd, uh, we'd live the life we choose, we'd fight and never lose, for we were young and sure to have our way. And that's how I felt. We were young and sure to have our way. I had great hopes about what was going to happen. Um, the hopes didn't weren't realized, and uh, I think there were many disappointments with people along the way. 
And now I can, I'm, old, I'm strong enough to say uh, there were great disappointments with me. Dis I was disappointed in myself. Many things. Tonight I stood before the tavern Nothing seemed the way 